confirm that the recording has started. Okay, great. So thank you, Kia. The recording has begun. And so I believe we're just looking for questions, either raising hands or in chat. And we're gonna just go ahead and start answering questions about the project. And so Kia, could you confirm that if someone would like to ask a question verbally, are they able to raise their hand and then just ask the question? Or we would need to unmute them, is that correct? Correct, it is a webinar, so um, they would have to, and I'm sorry, I just have everyone pinging me right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so they would have to raise their hand and then we would have to give them um, the ability to, to, to talk. Yeah, we would give them that access. Okay, perfect. So it looks like we do have, well, Rick's hand is raised. Yeah, I, I have a question from a member of WASPIC. I'm unable to start my video, but that's okay. Uh, can the uh, uh, money that's available for technology be used uh, to meet the first three obligations, uh, particular medications, the 30-day supply? Um, what I mean by that is there, we're looking at doing medications because we have a large pretrial population. They get out unanticipated release times and dates. And that medication, because there's no 24 hour pharmacies um, in those uh, some of those remote areas, can that money be used to meet that obligation, that 30 days of medication and or MOUD medication upon release? Rick, to clarify your question, I suspect you're talking about the machine that allows uh, dispensing on site. Is that what you're asking about? Yes, thank you. That's okay. the information you gave me. And I've got members asking that question if they can use that money to um, purchase those machines to meet the obligations. Okay, that is a great question. And I think tentatively I want to say yes, but can you send that one to our to our inbox email and we'll provide a more comprehensive answer as part of our FAQ document that we're working on? Absolutely. I'll I'll try to make it clearer than my kind of jumbled way of approaching it. And I'll send a, oh, that... uh, uh, an example that Mark sent me. And, Thank you. And Emma, if anybody on the team um, has been in the hospital, the, the, the thing they'll be familiar with is something we used to call Pixis machines. Yeah. Um, that That's the that's the technology we're talking about. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Rick. I think that that'll be uh, uh, good to confirm. Uh, Emma, do you have that email? Uh, or Kia, can we put our email in the chat for everybody so they can follow up if necessary? Thank you. And I see Emma to everybody. So hopefully that goes to the attendees as well. I do see Linda on. It looks like Linda, you're unmuted. You have a question. Uh, well, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Uh, the chat box does not work. You've got it disabled. So Thank just you very FYI. Much. <laughs> All right. Kia, is that something you're you're able to? Um, I, yeah. Uh, typically, we disable the chat box for anyone but the panelists. That's what webinars typically are for. So, if you'd like me to allow others, I can go ahead and attempt to enable it. So, um, just give me a moment. Thank you. In the meantime, though, attendees, you can certainly raise your hands, and we'll unmute you for any. Uh, questions or discussion you might be interested in with regard to this initiative. So Jason, maybe it would help while we're we're getting all of the um, te technical difficulties fixed. Um, if I just gave an update on DOC, that may generate some questions from the folks that are attending on how that may apply to their particular area. Great. Sounds good, Lisa. Thank you. Perfect. Now the only problem is, is I don't know how to share on Zoom. And let's see here. Am I sent you my thing? Maybe you can show it to me and I'll give this. On the bottom, you should be able just to um you should be able just to move your mouse and down below it should say share and you should be able okay. to click on that. Let's see if I can do that for folks. Not one of my strong points on the bottom. 
Lisa, I thought it pulled up for you. Oh, thank you so much. Very good. So I, I just to kind of share what the Department of Corrections is doing for folks, we've got uh, multiple irons in the fire at the moment. And um, so for us, we're needing to collaborate with not only health services, but our prisons division, our reentry division, and our community corrections divisions based on impacts that will occur in each of those areas. So opening up conversation for folks in all of those areas and saying, hey, this is what it looks like. This is what um, we're moving forward to do. Can you see how this may impact your area? It has been really um, amazing to share that type of information and for things that we didn't think of in health services for either the prisons division or reentry or anything like that to, to really come forward and say, well, you know what, it may have an impact here. So um, encouraging those types of conversations. We're also assessing our current telehealth infrastructure and utilization um, to see if we're actually maximizing our ability to um, use telehealth, uh, especially to reduce transportation uh, needs for connecting them with their community providers that'll be taking care of them. Our staffing needs, as you can imagine, because I'm sure you're looking at your staffing needs are important, um, developing any budget impact. So what I mean by that is the capacity building funds will assist us in this three-year period, but we're, you know, banking on, we're going to have it renewed. And so we're looking at what that looks like for the next five-year period and what capacity building funds may cover and what it may not. So we're trying to do that advanced planning um, and um, what we may need to do through decision packages or funding requests. Um, of course, we meet with HCA routinely to discuss processes and challenges. Um, we had to update our central pharmacy software and install um, a switch interface to allow for billing, uh, which we haven't necessarily needed to do. We're actually creating a brand new policy uh, to really create a transparent structure um, so people can see what we're doing with the waiver, how reentry and discharge services should look, how we connect uh, the social work needs that are being done um, with reentry who supports us in health related social needs, and then uh, developing a um, communication plan, which is huge for us because we want to be able to communicate to our staff, to the incarcerated population, to the public of what the Department of Corrections is partnering with HCA on, and then expanding current MOUD program delivery with um, sustainable um, outcomes. So it's what do we need to make that so it's open for everyone and is really a strong um, program in all of our facilities. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, we're looking at the challenges on the next slide. Thanks, Emma. And, and some of our biggest things for the Department of Corrections is we don't necessarily have community providers near our facilities. Monroe is kind of their own where right there on the I-5 corridor, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. But when you look at facilities like Coyote Ridge, Stafford Creek, Clallam Bay, um, we don't necessarily have providers and those community linkages. And especially if you have somebody who's at Stafford Creek, who is releasing to a county on the east side, um, maybe up in OMAC, and how are we yeah. going to connect them to, you know, chronic illness providers in those areas? And so we're kind of looking at that and how that will look in those challenges. Mm -hmm. And again, just those transportation challenges, um, when we're moving a whole bunch of people to the community for uh, to meet with providers, then that also impacts our prison program operations. So we may get so many um, folks that need access to care that it takes away our, our regular staff from a recreation area. And so we're, we're trying to balance and really look at that telehealth utilization and um, try to engage with the community providers to allow telehealth to be an option for us. Um, space is always at a premium. I'm sure it is at your locations. And so the ability to, to have room for the added staff and even confidential telehealth areas is something we're assessing, um, developing data and informatic platforms to support the waiver metrics so we can give HCA the information that they need and to reflect um, our compliance 
um, and improvements in the area that the waiver promotes. And then identifying training and education needs for our staff. What all do we need to tell and who needs to be in the room? And then the last one is the one that's always the scariest is discovering the unknowns, the things we haven't even thought of yet. And so that's why really having those um, those mm -hmm. collaborations and lots of communication with our other divisions, with HCA, with our community partners, um, is going to be truly, truly significant. So just based on that, if that helps anybody with some of your questions, that's what we've got going on in DOC uh, with a lot more to that, but just to share some of the, those updates. Thank you, Emma and Jason. Thank you. So as a reminder, we can put questions in the chat or if you raise your hand, we will unmute you. I don't see any questions in the chat, uh, Emma, but I was thinking uh, maybe um, a link to the information that we have um, online might be a good uh, reminder if uh, folks have probably already seen that, or maybe you're new to this work and might like a recap of that work. There's a webinar we previously uh, did that uh, really is a was a deeper dive into what the waiver uh, our Medicaid work involves, and um, that might be a good uh, start for you in addition to some additional material. Uh, the timeline right now is uh, for any jails interested in the first opportunity, which is a July 2025 opportunity, is to get a letter of intent in or a, a, a expression of intent in, which is a template form we have developed in the links Emma's provided, and that is uh, due by June. And then there's two other opportunities, at least, um, if you might not be ready quite that soon. Um, so, Emma, anything um, along those lines it might be a good reminder for folks that you just uh, reiterate? <clears throat> that was a great overview. Thank you. I am seeing a question. So, Wilma, I'm wondering if you want to go ahead and ask your question. I, I will. I can't. I'm going to lower my hand here before I forget. Um, but I work with a number of jails and they all have a little bit of different interpretation about what case management means. <laughs> to me, it's not um, they want to involve the court in case management. And I'm like, ah, that's what we're looking for. So can you explain um, what case management is? That is a great question, and I'm happy to answer it, but Colette, I'm actually wondering if you want to come off mute and give a little bit of an overview on the service, and when we'll have more information. Or Jason. I was just going to ask mm -hmm. Colette Jones, too, our lead nurse who's working on some of that clinical question now. Wilma, thanks for the question. Colette, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Um, I'm Colette Jones, by the way. I'm a manager on Jason's team and supporting the benefit design for this work. I also encourage our Arthur Andrews, who has been really leaning in to um, ensure this is a cohesive design. Please jump in and support the response as you see fit. Um, so case management is a function that is a uh, clinical function by design. It's not a legal function, so it wouldn't be appropriate um, to involve the courts. This is more um, navigating healthcare services for a particular individual and engaging that individual in selection and um, choices for recovery and stability in their um, chronic and, and urgent healthcare needs, um, making sure that they're really um, supported pre-release and uh, understand what the options are available to uh, support them in navigating the healthcare system, understanding and mapping to the right providers to give them those uh, choices, talk through what treatment options might be appropriate, identify diagnoses that may be needed, and then um, identify what the post-release uh, treatment plan might be. So ensuring that that individual understands how to best support their health care needs is uh, really the, the scope of this um, case management. 
Arthur, yeah. what and else? That's, you, oh, please. I was well, going to say that that is totally my understanding, but I just wanted to make sure that when I meet with them, I can say, "Hey, <laughs> it's not it's not involving the courts and um, the um, probation officers." You know, um, we currently have um, we subcontract with a reentry team, so they are certified peers. And I noticed under one of your things, the services by community health workers, is that, and I mean, are these certified CHWs or are they certified peers? Can they all bill for services that they perform in the jail? Great questions, Wilma. I'm going to pull those apart into two different questions because we have two different benefit designs. One is case management, which is a clinical function that can use a team model to support care and services um, that's appropriate for that individual. It may need a, I don't know, a licensed social worker or a registered nurse to identify the clinical pathway, but it may be a non-licensed clinician, I'm sorry, a non-licensed uh, individual who is best uh, um, able to do outreach and engagement and support that um, individual in uh, healthcare recovery concepts. So it may very well be a team model, which could have a community health worker on that team as part of that response. Um, separate and apart from that, oh, and just more on that legal pathway, um, there's definitely a lot of pathway navigation that needs to be done through that legal lens, right? There's a lot of um, support that the probation officer and the, um, the courts offer to these individuals, but this is really separate and apart from that. This is a healthcare concept supporting individuals in navigating stabilization of their health. So uh, pulling that apart into two different realms here. Um, uh, let me pivot to Arthur, please. Or Call it maybe. To, maybe you'd address the peers question as well. <clears throat> For sure. Wow. A peer may be a very helpful part of that team that is helping support that case management and may be the best suited to really connect and engage um, individuals. And that may be part of our case management team design in um, uh, being a uh, helpful in navigating that course um, under the purview of that clinical oversight from that um, licensed social worker or nurse or what have you. Then you also asked about the community health worker benefit, but before I pivot to that, I just feel the need to check in with Arthur. Arthur, any other sketch points here? No, I think I think you hit you hit it really well. I mean, this is a this is a clinical role that is looking at the individual holistically, um, you know, for their healthcare needs, whether that's you know a clinical need being need to connect to a doctor or a referral to a specialist or medications to maybe even connecting them with health related social needs. You know, maybe they need help connecting with a housing coordinator or oh, something of that nature. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Arthur. Really concrete. Um, so then. Uh, separate, we also have another benefit that we're designing that is a community health worker benefit. And we're standing up a service to help um, support payment directly to community health workers who are very skilled in navigating community supports, doing outreach, doing engagement, really connecting to individuals, and maybe best poised to really do that kind of engagement and um, recovery-oriented conversations. So we really want to leverage the um, lived experience that a community health worker may have or the um, expertise in connecting how to navigate a certain challenge in the community through that community health worker. So that is another benefit that we are um, in uh, implementing in order to support really a, a wraparound approach to best navigate um, how to release with really good healthcare supports in place. Well, there's a follow-on question here is how that how is that or are they billable services uh, separately billable or bundled under uh, say a provider rate? Thank you. Great question. And um, the details of the billing structure we are still navigating. However, yes, they are both billable case management and community health workers. They are separately billable. 
and we want to encourage that uptake because both have um, really good uh, opportunities here to serve this population and see improved health outcomes. So we are looking at ways to uh, have that be set up to really improve that um, touch point how, and um, have those as resources for this population. Well, let's to put something together that you and um, Arthur were talking about a moment ago. We use the term healthcare services for um, for care coordination, but would it be fair to say it's more social and health ser services as opposed to just health services? So it includes um, transportation and uh, ID and and acts, um, housing and food. So is it is it broader than just health services? Right. So great point, Mark. I think the um, the intent is really to stabilize a client's health in context of their life, right? You cannot cut off part of this client and only treat this one piece. You need to look at this um, need holistically in the whole realm of what does this client need to be safe and supported and moving towards improved health outcomes. And in order to get to improved care for diabetes or what have you, you need to be able to have food and transportation to your doctor and you need to be able to navigate all of that. So for sure, yes, it is um, also addressing social aspects of this work as well. So again, just to really make sure that we un we all understand it. So it's social support in social services in support of healthcare. So theoretically, if you had somebody, uh, you know, 20 year old who was perfectly healthy, never had any health problems of any kind and needed help finding a job, it would be hard to stick that in under the, uh, get that reimbursed because it just would have no healthcare com relationship. Is, would that be a fair statement? I would argue that everyone has healthcare needs. Even a client that does not have any existing conditions that's diagnosed, they still have preventive care needs. And we wanna make sure that that client has developmentally appropriate care that is caught early and supported and able to navigate so that they can lead life to their fullest. All right, so we're gonna um, find, a, I get, it, we're gonna find a way of interpreting social support in as broadest way as possible, it sounds like, um, without breaking the law. I think I might just to serve add somebody, too. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, excuse me. I was just going to underline serving somebody holistically is um, the hope so that we can really see uh, connectivity and improved outcomes. Go ahead, Jason. I, yeah, I mean, I would just agree with that. And uh, Mark, the other thought I had is there there are a number of what we call health related social need services that Medicaid can offer to you mentioned employment. Yes, we're not going to find somebody a job, but we actually can help support people through counsel uh, and work job preparation work, uh, which we call supportive employment. And so that is a benefit we can offer. Uh, it is a limited benefit, but it's one that is available. So I would agree with uh, Paulette in that regard. There may be some things that probably we cannot do uh, that probably are not related as much, but even the court services um, might be worth understanding, uh, Wilma, to a little bit more detail about what are we talking about in terms of those court and probation services so we could fully explore. But I would tend to agree most of those services uh, probably not something we would uh, uh, Medicaid would pay for because there's an independent court or legal requirement and Medicaid doesn't pay for court or legal requirements necessarily. Uh, yeah, and I would just I yeah, would just say please. on that that court, I think it's just um, a, di a disconnect um, with administrators reading, jail administrators reading like, oh, we've got a case management, that's release, when we're already actually doing the work in the jail and doing a, you know, I think it's just a dis disconnect and we need some, I will educate them about this. Um, but I do have one other uh, question and it's kind of uh, related to the um, billing portion of it. So our jail does subcontract 
with that social service, that reentry component, does some contract with a behavioral health organization um, to also provide some group classes and targeted interventions while people are in the jail. So if that is in their care plan by the, the medical staff at the jail saying, yes, they connected with reentry, are those service providers able to directly bill Medicaid or is it the jail billing on behalf of those service providers? Another great question, Wilma. Yes. <laughs> Getting in the weeds. <laughs> Arthur, call you want to take that one or? Yeah, I'll jump into that. And um, I think some of it we might need to take as a follow-up question, Wilma. But what I'll generally say is we want to support um, access to the services. So any willing and eligible provider is able to offer services and bill Medicaid for, um, for covered services. So many of our providers that are in the community and serving clients today also serve Medicaid clients uh, in the um, non-carceral setting, right? And so they may already be familiar and accustomed to billing, and we want to encourage and support that continued access for our uh, clients who are incarcerated. So we don't want to get in the way of this, right, and cause any artificial barriers. We do want to support um, billing for those who are new to this structure. And so to that end, that is our intent is to put a structure in place to support that and be able to um, have a uh, contractor, a third party administrator to help us um, ensure that there is seamless billing that's happening and can really support access. Right. I think another piece of your question that you put in, uh, and then I know Rick, you've had your hand up, we'll, we'll pivot to you next, thank you. Um, and one other piece of Wilma's question that I want to take back is you mentioned that there are um, there are services that are occurring that come in and support clients. And I think it probably depends on what the scope of those services are and how uh, that falls into the structure of the reentry benefit um picture. So I'd love to know a little bit more about what those services look like and um, whether, you know, what they're providing and so forth and be able to give you more concrete of an answer. Is that something you can um, send in a follow-up question? Um, sure. Do you want me just to send that to, hey, baby. to the demonstration project? Yeah, hey, baby. Sure. Yeah. Oh, we're getting some uh, feedback from somebody who needs to mute their line. Um, yes, yeah, so if you just send that into the reentry demonstration project email, that'd be great. Okay, Thanks, Wilma. Uh -huh. Thank you, Wilma. Great questions. And so, do great. we want to go to Rick and then Barry next? And there's a good uh, follow up question here in the chat, maybe uh, about um, sort of this Mark's question about support of employment, and we could we'll get to that uh, next as well. Rick, that's what I wanted to. Uh, a lot of jails around the state are doing unique reentry programs. Would it be beneficial for WASPIC to put out a quick question since we've got everyone's ear and get a comprehensive list and get that to the HCA? Because uh, I know in part of the state, because of their geographic location, they need this type of reentry service versus uh, east side, west side. So it's just something I've been around the state and seen all these different programs and there are some unique things happening and a comprehensive list may be of a benefit. Just a question. Great idea, Rick, thank you. To take that a step further, I wonder, to, because you guys have nothing to do with Healthcare Authority um, and you need more work, I, I wonder if we could kind of start to accumulate a list of um, it's not a Q and A, but uh, allowable and not allowable things. As you see these examples, as people ask questions, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we just kind of compile something that people can come back to as a, re a reference thing and say ah, that if that's an allowed, that's not. So we have an FAQ that I believe will be posted starting this week. And I think what we can do is as we start getting those types of questions in, we can organize them such that we have info on allowable and unallowable items. And then there is some information in the overview document that got pushed out a few weeks ago and is also online. So thank you. And we'll get started on that. And maybe oh, since 
terms or programs mean different things in different parts of the state, we just get a brief description. Right on. Thank you. Do we want to turn to Barry? Sure. If that's all right. Hello, Barry. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. I, I, we live and work in Northeast Washington. Um, and we really want to support the jail in, in providing the best care that they can and getting different outcomes for folks. I'm a family doctor up here. I've lived up here since 1990 and worked in the area. I go into the jail and I provide medical care there. Our team, which is part of a nonprofit called Hope Street, also provides um, case management. Um, and uh, is, we've been working on homelessness for a number of years. Um, our, our team is really skilled in terms of peer support, case management, um, navig navigator skills. We, we want to have the, we're going to have a conversation with our jailer tomorrow. He's very supportive of this plan. I, uh, we're going to have, we're creating clean and sober housing. So we don't have any um, recovery uh, residences up here, but that's our intention. So we have this broad approach to this thing, very comprehensive. Um, the plan that we have uh, in mind is going to be comprehensive in people getting into recovery housing and then working on job skills and life and tools for recovery and the whole work. So we think we're well poised to really support the the jailers and the leadership in our county to, to develop different outcomes. Um, so we're going to have a conversation with our jailer tomorrow. I just want to be as effective as I can be in having this conversation with our jailer. So any thoughts that you have about what we should emphasize, because we really want to support them in, in writing that uh, letter of intent and, and uh, being a, a partner organization with our jail. Thank you, Dr. Big. And that, I think that is an ideal situation to be in, in the sense of not only the treatment induction, but but the supportive programs. Colin, I think you touched on that a bit. Anything more you would uh, describe in terms of this, or the peer support, the CHW support, the other supports that we would uh, want to offer uh, Dr. Bacon in his conversation with his uh, partners? I think that we touched on most of it already, Dr. Bacon. The only thing that I would um, underline is that we are intending to set this up to be um, as flexible as possible within our allowance to really incentivize the existing relationships. So we are working to see how do we make sure that these services can be delivered by the already existing networks that facilities already have. To your point, exactly like a provider coming in um, doing some of these services already, we want to encourage that. We want to increase um, access. So uh, we are intending to support this as uh, um, incentivizing that existing relationship. Barry, what jail do you work with? Uh, Stevens County. Stevens County. Thanks. So, so none of this, um, none of the services. We feel really well poised to be able to provide the services. I think the thing that scares us the most is the billing part, and how that's going to go. So having that, that level of support, having someone that helps us through that process, is probably um, the thing that that uh, bothers us or or concerns us the most. So thanks for offering that. Sure. Thanks for the ask. feedback. Yes, thank you. Can I ask, are, are you a Medicaid provider today or the folks in your uh, network there you're intending to offer services for? No, I'm not. Um, I don't. So we, in my private practice, I'm what's called a direct primary care provider. So we're outside of the, of the Medicaid or the insurance model. And the reason for that is we have quite a number of folks without insurance or have high deductibles. So we have to keep our costs as low as possible. We don't have the infrastructure for billing. So I appreciate that. There's a couple of things I might note then in terms of your preparations for conversation that I also think is important for just the general group. Colette touched on a little bit in terms of supports for billing that we'll offer. Um, so we do intend to uh, really what we're, we're, we're calling a, a contract or a third party administrator approach to help with uh, just that question. So people who are not billing providers today, they can either do that themselves and become one, or they could uh, work with um, an entity 
uh, to help with that billing uh, process. So we, we intend to continue with that uh, a design and uh, co potential contract uh, effort along those lines. That might help, uh, uh, Barry. The other thing I might mention is any servicing provider, any billable provider will have to become a Medicaid provider. Now, that's a, that's a contract with HCA that we call our core provider agreement. And that is something we just cannot um, waive. That's got to be done. Now, most people already in the state even doing work like you are, Barry, are already going to be a Medicaid contractor uh, uh, in one way or another. We we do estimate maybe a quarter to 30, 40% might not be depending on the situation such as yourself. So you'd have to do that in the very least uh, to, to be a billable um, provider. Right. Team, did I get anything else you might add to Barry's? And then we'll go to... Uh, 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 jo Joni's question. Jason, just one quick yeah, comment. Please. So we cer I certainly don't mind taking care of Medicaid patients. I do that currently. Um, and we would, we would do it. We'd probably do it outside of our current clinic. Um, just because, um, whenever you add those layers of coders and billers and, and that sort of thing, it just adds an additional cost. And we're, our whole point is to try to keep our costs as low as possible. But we would, we would, that's very doable. And I, th I think as long as we had the support to be able to create such a structure, um, that's all, that sounds, sounds great. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. I would hope we can offer that level of support in some regard. That's going to be a question mark for us is exactly how that's going to fit with your uh, program. It might be worth some follow-up uh, a conversation at some point. You could do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Great questions. Should I just read Joni's question or uh, Joni, do you want to come off mute to, so we can make sure we can address this? So um, regardless of substance abuse, are we serving beyond SUD? And the answer to that is absolutely. SUD, particularly Matt for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder is fundamental. That is a must do. Um, and then 30 days supply of medication, all medication upon release is a must. And then the care coordination is a must. Then there is a secondary set of benefits that's a may. That includes the entire pharmacy benefit within that uh, 90 days prior to release. In addition to a fairly robust set of behavioral health and um, other uh, evaluation and treatment um, uh, codes that Colette could go into a little bit more detail. Anything else we, we should address here? In addition to some of the HRSN work we touched on earlier, the health-related social needs services, support of employment, support of housing, and some of those related services. Peer just, and application. Just to make it clear to everybody, and you, you said it, but sometimes it's confusing. The 30-day go-home medications is, as you say, all medications, not just substance. So the antibiotics and the blood pressure medication, the heart medication, Door in the in the ninety days prior to release, that's where there's more flexibility beyond the um, the substance use treatment medications. But on those thirty days is everything. Want to be sure everybody's clear. Thank you. That that clears it up for me. Thank you. I'm just saying, I'm not seeing any hands. Or am I missing hands, folks? I do see a couple other chats. Where do we want to go to next, team? Emma, you seem to be on top of this in the chats here. I'm losing it. I'm losing the chats. Uh, so um, where do we want to go to next? Um, you know, I am not necessarily seeing. So there was a question about a formal contract provided for a review by legal teams. And so I think the short answer there can be that we are working on the contract right now and we'll plan to be circulating it probably in the, that June, July time period for folks to review and by their legal teams. And so if there's concerns or questions about signing up for a cohort before seeing contractual documentation, please send that to our inbox and we can work with you on that. Emma, this is Teresa Chamorro. I'll just add that we've been working with contracts and basically because almost all of the carceral facilities are connected to state agencies, 
or run by city and county. It's actually an agreement, sort of an intra-agency agreement that we're working on. And it will be all of the things that you would expect it to be with essentially the amount of funding for the first cohort, et cetera. So we're happy to share that as it's not quite final yet, but we're working on that. And that is for successful um, carceral facilities who have submitted a letter of intent that then is successfully reviewed by HCA and we'll follow that up probably early July. I might make a clarifying point here. Uh, Teresa, thank you, that's, that's perfect. I think we're talking about any of the sort of grant dollars that we want to make available uh, prior to service dollars going live. So in other words, the grant dollars can be pushed out to the door here soon. And that's what Teresa is talking about. Um, and hopefully we'll have some sort of streamlined process for that with say uh, mile posts of performance and Teresa, anything more you want, might want to say about that? And then the links show the million dollars to each facility based on size. That's 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 what we're talking about in terms of readiness grants. Service is a little bit different. We can talk about that next. Teresa? Yeah, I'm just going to add a couple of things. So one is that the letter of intent is really a commitment that, that we are entering in an agreement with HCA that you are going to essentially fill out the application, which is the um, budget as well as how you plan to use the capacity building dollars. So that's sort of the what we're asking for in the letter of intent. It would also be helpful. I've been having some um, individual chats with some folks. If you know you are going to submit a letter of intent, it would be great to know which facility you represent. And you could just put it in the chat. That would give us a sense of, again, it's not a commitment that you're putting it in the chat, but if you know you're going to send one in and haven't sent it in yet, it'd be great to hear from you in the chat just, and you can either send it to me personally if you don't wanna make it public um, or send it to us in the HCA demonstration project. Um, email that is in the chat and happy to put that back in. Just would be helpful to know how many of you are participating because we're starting to set up some structure uh, to help make sure that, that all of that happens and can get that out quickly. Thank you. And so, and Ed, Edward, uh, I would uh, welcome you to come off mute. So we're making sure we address your uh, question as well. Um, so I think that's, that's stage one, you know, intent to participate, Getting some early dollars to help readiness. Yes, there's got to be some agreement to that, as Teresa's noted. And then there is service readiness. So again, maybe you're ready for July of 2025. I noted earlier, you need to be a, a we need to have a licensed uh, provider. We need to have a provider who signs that core provider agreement with Medicaid and then meets a number of readiness reviews pursuant to the sort of total facility. So the facility, we've got to ensure care management's there. The facility, we've got to ensure Medicaid-assisted treatments there for alcohol use disorder and opioid use. We've got to make sure 30-day supply meds are available. Not a contract per se, but a readiness review document. And then that core provider agreement is the basis, is basically the contract for those billable providers. So just wanting to highlight some of that. Edward, I'm not sure if that completely addresses your question or if there's anything more that uh, you might be interested in clarifying. No, uh, actually, Teresa has been chatting with me on the side. Uh, we were just wanting to get our letter of intent in and we want to make sure we still follow the county policy for accepting funds and so forth through our legal and all that good stuff. So I need to explain that to my sheriff who's signing it tomorrow. Thank you, Edward. And thank you, Teresa. Anything else you might note, Teresa, for the group in, in this chat that might be helpful for others? No, I think we've covered it. And again, really appreciate the questions and also encourage you to put the questions uh, after this meeting. And we have a second uh, uh, office hours that I'm sure Emma's going to talk about in a couple of weeks. And the questions that you put in the reentry demonstration project email is really helpful for us so we can continue to track those and then put them in the FAQs for other folks. This is the first cohort. So all of these questions are brand new. As we continue down this line, we have a second and a third cohort and we're learning a lot from these questions and really appreciate it. 
Great. And thank you, Island County, Spokane County, Wakayakum, uh, Enumclaw. Thank you for uh, um, working on your intent to participate. Appreciate it. Emma, team, did you see any other chats? Or I don't think I see any hands up, but I may have missed some. I don't see any other chats right now. I This is a big crowd today. I do want to just make a plug for if you have any facility specific questions or any questions that you'd be more comfortable asking in a smaller group, we're more than happy to do one-to-ones and are expecting to have to do one-to-ones with each individual facility that's planning to participate in any cohort, but especially in cohort one. So please, please feel free to reach out to our inbox and we'll set up some meeting time with you. We can take questions via email, but we can also find some time for an individual chat. Yes, I would just emphasize that. Thank you, Emma. And uh, again, you can send us an email through the email box that, that uh, we have prepared. Maybe we'll throw that in the chat one more time. And thank you, Kirkland. And thank you, uh, Stevens County. Appreciate that, Barry. Um, and, you know, continue to let us know if there are questions that come up. And uh, as, as we all venture on this together, I'm sure there will be many. And we're just about at time. Anything more for today? We'll just give it another minute or two in case you have any questions come up or anybody wants to come off mute for a a question, we could just put your hand up and we'll make sure to do that. Very easy. Thank you. I'll just do a short little plug for our next office hours. So our next office hours is Thursday, May 23rd from 11 to 12 p.m. And the Zoom link should be online. I'm not going to put it in chat because the last time I did that, I shared the wrong link. So <laughs> please go on to our website and you can find the, the link to register there. And then thank you, Tyron, for putting our inbox email address into chat. I'm around. I can stick on for like another 10 to 15 minutes if there's questions. But if you have another question right now, we still have a couple of minutes. So feel free to raise your hand or put them into chat. Well, while we're waiting, I'm going to call it. I'm going to um, go back to the case management because I think it's such a um, new concept for a lot of people. W would you Would you kind of consider that the orchestra leader for reentry position um, that's putting, making sure all the pieces are working and the person who's doing case management does not, or tell me, do they not have to have any specific credential uh, rather than making sure all the pieces are working? Great questions. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, ideally, in the ideal sense, that yes, we have a case manager who is orchestrating and supporting the client's choices, supporting the connection to the right next step in care. How do we um, facilitate and, and wrap around and support that client? What I will call out is there's not a requirement that every individual client must participate in case management in order to have access to the reentry benefits. So they may still get access to MOUD or the 30-day prescriptions or any of the other benefits and decline case management services. We want to support, we want to offer, we want to be there when that individual is ready and in um, willing to engage. But I want to make sure that this is not a gatekeeping structure. So um, be, be um, mindful of that as we move forward. Um, and the other piece of your question, oh, the individual and whether they need to have any specific credentials. Uh, so this is a Medicaid service. And for that, um, there is a mandate that the um, billing entity has uh, the cl a clinician overseeing a Medicaid service. So that is why we are building a team-based model for case management where the team is led by a licensed clinician, like a licensed social worker or a registered nurse, perhaps. And that clinician is the one overseeing the appropriateness of the case management occurring in the model. They may very well have team members in the case management model that are billing under that licensure. 
that are um, providing services uh, to, you know, be appropriate and they may be unlicensed, um, but it is all within the purview of that licensure type. So uh, did that answer all your questions, Mark? Yeah, no, I think I think that's good. And that's one of the things that, that we in the jail world are going to need to kind of learn because a lot of these services, for example, are provided in some jails by correctional officers. Mm -hmm. um, but what you just said is, is really helpful. Also, the term clinician is going to mean different things to different people. In some places, it means the doctor, the nurse practitioner, where, whereas what you just said is helpful. It's, it's, it could be an, uh, an RN. It could be an LPN. Could be yes, no. Uh, so I will say this is one piece of our um, structure that we are still emerging so for sure, licensed social worker, for sure, registered nurse, we're looking at what other licensure types are appropriate here. An LPN may be part of the team, but cannot be the one directing the care. Okay. So it'd be good at some point, I'm glad we're talking about it, to maybe create that list so everybody knows up front who can, who can be at the head of the team. For sure. That's exactly you, what we're doing, Mark. Great, great clarification. And, and I think we've got some work to do in that regard along the lines of matching that team up with the whole benefit package. So we talked about the mandatory services. Those secondary sort of services are broad as well. And so we are also working on defining that in a good um, detail. So that'll be um, available uh, hopefully soon. One of the things that'll probably be helpful, and it's going to really show my ignorance, is you know how how are these things billed? Are they billed on the basis of it's a one-time thing you've done it? Um, is it is it based on the amount of time you spent? Is there complexity score? Um, you know, somebody you might offer the service, you might spend five minutes with somebody, and they say they decline, and so you've offered it, you've satisfied the requirement. Is that billable versus the other person who's required hours and hours of care coordination to get what they need? I don't think we can answer it today, but something that I think we'll want to understand. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Mark. We're taking those into consideration as the model's getting more concretely uh, built so that we have all your questions and answers along the way. Thanks. So just want to acknowledge that we're at noon, so uh, a few of us can stay on for a little bit longer and really appreciate all of you who put things in the chat and participated in this conversation. And Emma, you want to go ahead and close? Sure. So I think, thank you for your time today. We're at noon and so we can let everybody go. But yes, again, we still have some folks that I think can stay on. And so we're happy to maybe take some last minute questions if there are any. And I see one about DEA numbers. And I know we've gotten this question in the past. I don't know if we have an answer for that at this time, but if someone, if any of the other panelists are able to respond to that question, that would be great. Otherwise, I think we can, this might be in our FAQ. Go ahead, Colette. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I need a little bit more context around um, how that DEA, DEA number is proposed to be used. So I don't know, Sean, if you're able to stay on and provide more, or you can provide that in writing. Well, uh, we may be looking at waiver, DEA waiver issues that have been in the change here related to MOUD. There's yeah. Sean. Sean, you're still on mute. There you go. Oh, am I unmuted now? Now yep. you're unmuted. We can hear you. I have no idea. My Zoom is messing up all over the place. Uh, so my, my concern is just, am I going to need a DEA number in order to store some of these medications? Because if I'm going to have to keep 30 days supply. And if some of these are controlled substances, because it's every medication that somebody's going to be on, then am I going to need a DEA number to be able to do that and get the proper secure storage and everything set up for it? And my sheriff's office already has a DEA number, but does the jail have to apply for their own or can I share that number and use that? And is that even necessary? I mean, if I don't need a DEA number to do that, then great. My understanding um, is that your DEA number is is always attached to an address, first of all. So if the sheriff's DEA number is at a different physical address, then you may need a separate one for the jail. The other issue that comes up is whether 
the what role a physician is playing. Um, a, the physician could, you could do it all under a physician's DEA number, but the physician would be totally responsible for um, all of the, the inventory and management, which is generally not the best solution. Okay. Jason, anybody in your team have anything more on I, that? I was going to offer, I think we should take this back to our pharmacy subgroup experts to be able to uh, more helpfully respond concretely. I agree. And I, without providing incorrect information here, I think we would want to clarify whether storing is a requirement of the program. So I think that's the at least one of the pieces of clarification that I feel like I need. Well, I mean, if we're not storing the medications, would it meet the criteria if we just had a prescription waiting for them at the local pharmacy for a 30-day supply? Because if that doesn't require it, then I'm going to have to, a lot of small jails, we're going to have to store those medications because we don't have in-house medical. I mean, I have Dr. Bacon, who is nice enough to have a contract with us and come down once a week, but I don't think he's going to want to take on, I don't want to speak for him, but I don't think he's going to want to take on storing all these medications. And then depending on when somebody gets out, I mean, we have court that runs until six o'clock at night sometimes. And then all of a sudden they're releasing somebody. We're not getting them released till seven, eight o'clock at night. Pharmacy is going to be closed. Clinics are going to be closed. I don't see any way for, at least for us smaller jails to get around this without having to store these medications. That and that would be, be good if we could talk about that offline because it also relates closely to the work that Rachel is doing with the um, with the legislative MOUD money and they're they're, they're kind of all tied together. That's and that's question. that is a question that I have too for my two municipal jails that are in the same boat. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for providing more context around this question. We'll take this back to the pharmacy team and provide more clarity. This is really helpful to know what uh, areas are outstanding for questions. Thanks. Thank you, appreciate it. Not seeing any other questions and we're almost 10 minutes over. So I think that might need to be it for today. Thanks everybody. Yes, thanks all. Thank Take you. care. Appreciate it.